says is Hukku Nabiikum, the love of your Prophet. Number two, Hukku Ahli Baytihi, the love of his family. Wa ala qira'atil Quran, and the reading of the Quran. Uh, so the Prophet makes it very clear that love of his family, of the Ahl al Bayt, is fard upon every single Muslim. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah number 42, verse number 23, Say, Qul is a fi'l amr, it's an imperative command. Say, I ask no reward for you, from you for this, except that you love the qurba. And the Mufassirin of the Qur'an are unanimous that the Qurba here referred to is the Ahl al-Bayt of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Imam Shafi'i says in a poem, Ya ala bayti Rasulillah, hubbukum fardun min Allahi fil kitab. O family of the house, O people of the house of the Messenger of God, your love is incumbent upon all of us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he said, مَنْ لَمْ يُصَلِّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَا صَلَاةَ لَا Whoever does not pray upon you or send benedictions upon you, there's no prayer for him. So according to Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah ta'ala, it's a rukun of the prayer. It's a pillar of the prayer to send salawat upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. If you don't do that, your prayer is not valid, according to the Shafi'i madhab. This is why Imam Shafi'i, because he was burning with a love of Ahl al-Bayt, he was accused by many ulama as being a rafidi, of being a shi'i, because he loved Ahl al-Bayt. Kayf, why, why do you have to be shi'i? Because you love Ahl al-Bayt. Love of Ahl al-Bayt is fard upon every single Muslim, whether they're Sunni, Sunni or shi'i. This is clear. The Prophet sallallahu in another hadith in Tirmidhi, he says, Allah lima bihi min ni'amihi. Love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his blessings upon you. Just contemplating the ni'am, the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, should engender love for him. We think about what he gives us, and that should engender love. It's the perfect stranger, Imam Zaid uses the example, if a perfect stranger walks up to you and gives you $100, $100 in cash, or $1,000 in cash, you don't even know the person. You, your heart might actually incline towards that person, and you might actually love that person. You don't even know who it is. Think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave you your life, everything, your parents, your wealth, everything, your existence. And then he said, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and love me for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. وَأَحِبُ أَهْلِ بَيْتِ لِحُبِّي أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ And love my family for the sake of me. When the latter part of this verse was revealed in Surah Al-Ahzab, ayah number fifty-six, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Ya أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ أَمْرُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا." There's two fi'l amr, and then I imperative and then a maf'ul uh, mutlaq an absolute infinitive absolute at the end of the verse which is for stress two imperatives and stress to send blessings of peace upon the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so one of the companions came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when this verse was revealed and said kayfa nusalli alayk how do we pray upon you and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said qul say allahumma salli ala muhammad Wa ala Ali Muhammad. Send blessings of peace upon Muhammad وسلم, and on the family of the Prophet Muhammad. So now the question arises who are the Ahlul Bayt? Right? Are the wives of the Prophet amongst Ahlul Bayt? So the dominant uh, uh, response here from the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that yes, indeed, the wives of the Prophet, وسلم, the Ummahatul Mu'mineen, are from Ahlul Bayt. And this is established in Quran and Hadith. So the term Ahlul Bayt is mentioned three times in the Quran. And in the immediate reference, in the immediate reference, it's referring to women. So, the, so in one ayah, for example, in Surah Hud, right, we're told that the angels came to the house of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And they gave Ibrahim alayhi salam and Sarah glad tidings of a son, Ishaq, but dahikat. And she laughed because she said, you know, I'm a, an old woman, I'm an ajuz, hadha ba'li shaykha, my husband is 100 years old, right? So she laughed, dahikat, and they named their son Ishaq, which in Hebrew means laughter, because she laughed. Right? And then the angel said, Ata'ajabina min Allah, rahmatullahi alaykum, rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu alaykum ahl al bayt, innahu hamilun majid. Do you wonder at the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Uh, mercy and, and blessings be upon you, O ahl al bayt. Right? The second occurrence of ahl al bayt is in Surah al Qisas. 
in chapter 28 of the Quran, <coughs> which we are told that the sister of Musa a.s. is following the baby Musa a.s. to see where he ends up through the river, and Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, picks him up, and he will not breastfeed from anyone, and he's going to die. So she says, Hal adullukum ala ahli baytin? Shall I uh, direct you towards an ahli bayt that will nurse him? Right, again, the reference is to women, the immediate reference. The last occurrence of Ahlul Bayt is in Surah Al Ahzab, in which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Inna ma yurid Allah liyuthib ankum rijza Ahlul Bayt wa yutahhirukum tathira." That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala only want, only wants to remove every type of stain from you, O Ahlul Bayt, and to render you pure and spotless. Right. So if you look at this ayah, what comes before and what comes after, we have direct speech of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. To the wives of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya nisa an nabi. That's tunuka ahadim min an nisa. Oh, wives of the Prophet, you're not like other women. Wa qarna fi buyuti kunna. Qarna fi al amr, which is for women. It's, a, it's, a, it's an imperative command, feminine plural. Wa ati'ala Allah wa rasulahu. Obey Allah and his messenger. Again, an imperative command, feminine plural. And then what comes after this verse? Wa qurna ma yutla fi buyuti kunna. Everything is feminine plural. But in the middle we have the statement, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُثِبُ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْلَ أَهْلِ الْبَيْتِ وَيُتَّهِرُكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا And this is in a masculine plural. Right? So this is evidence that the wives of the Prophet وسلم, are also included in Ahl al-Bayt. There's also a hadith in Sahih Muslim uh, where we're told, this is also in, in, included in Imam Nawawi's Riyadh al-Salihin, Volume 1. We are told that two tabi'is, named, one named Hussein, and one named Amr, they came to Zayd ibn Arqam and they asked him, Who are the Ahlul Bayt? Alaysa Nisa'ahu min Ahlul Baytihi? Are the women, are the wives of the Prophet from Ahlul Bayt? And he said, Yes. And he said, Also the sons of Aqil and Ja'far and Abbas. Radiallahu anhum, Ijma'in. So this is the dominant opinion. There are some who say that only the wives of the Prophet are Ahlul Bayt. And this is regarded as a heretical position. It's not only the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. Now within Ahlul Bayt, there's a group of five people that have a special distinction with the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. And these five are called Ahlul Kisa. So there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which is in Muslim and Tabarani. It's a Sahih hadith, related by Umm Salama, Umm Al-Mu'mineen, radiallahu in which he says that the Prophet ﷺ was sleeping on a Kisa Khaybari, in my quarters, on a, a mat from Khaybar, he was sleeping on it. And Fatima Zahra السلام, entered into the room, and she had some sweets or desserts with her or something. The Prophet وسلم, wakes up, and he sees her, and he says, go call your husband and your two sons. So she goes and brings who? Imam Ali, alayhi salam. And you can say alayhi salam for Ahlul Bayt. No problem. Imam Bukhari, in a handwritten manuscript of Sahih, of Sahih Bukhari, he says, Fatima alayhi salam. No problem. I say salam alaykum to you all the time. What can be said about Ahl al Bayt? No problem whatsoever. Right? So here comes Imam Ali and Al Hassanain. Imam Hassan alayhi salam. Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. And they begin eating a meal on this Kisa Khaybari. And the Prophet وسلم, he takes this Kisa and he drapes it over his head and over the head of Ali and Hassanain and Fatima al Zahra. And this is the sabab al-nuzul of the verse we quoted earlier. This is when that part of the verse was revealed. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجِزَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُتَهِّرُكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا This is when it was revealed. And Umm Salama, she says, and there's different riwayat, and one of them she says that, I tried to stick my head underneath the kisa. Right? And the Prophet stopped her and said, أَنْتِ إِلَى خَيْرٍ You're okay. You're okay. Why did the Prophet ﷺ stop her from doing that? There's a lot of wisdom in that. Because these five are definitely from Ahlul Bayt. There's no doubt about it. These five are from Ahlul Bayt. Who are they? The Prophet ﷺ, obviously. Fatima Zahra, Ali, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein. There's a hadith of, in the Musnad of Ahmad. أَخَذَ بِيَدِ الْحَسَنَيْنِ That the Prophet ﷺ, he took the hands of Imam Hassan and Hussein. And he said, مَنْ أَحَبَّنِي وَحَبَّ هَدَيْنِي وَأُمَّهُمَا وَأَبَاهُمَا 
كان معي في درجتي يوم كان معي في درجتي يوم القيامة أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام Whoever loves me and these two and their mother and their father will be with me at my station on the day of judgment. Loving these five Ahlul Kisa. There's another hadith, a very famous hadith, which is called Hadith al Thaqalain. Hadith al Thaqalain. This hadith is mutawatir. It's related by many. Muslim Ahmad Tirmidhi. A mutawatir hadith is a multiply attested hadith, which, according to the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah, has the creedal and legislative weight of a Quranic ayah. It's a factual statement. Those who deny hadith mutawatir, it is as if they're not denying. The Quran is dalil qat'i, definitive proof. So it's kufr. To deny hadith mutawatir is kufr. So the Prophet وسلم, and this riwayah is from Sahih Muslim, Zayd ibn Arkham, relates. He said, on the way back from Hajjatul Wada', we stopped at a place called Khadira Khum, which was a, there was a pond and there were some trees. And he says, the Prophet وسلم, he turns and he addresses the entire congregation. And he says, Inni tarikun fikum al-thaqalain. I have left behind me two weighty things. Kitabullahi hablun mamdudun min as-sama'i ila al The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is a lifeline or a cable extension from the heavens to the earth. The analogy is like someone drowning in the ocean and someone throws him a line. And then he says, Wa'itrati ahlu bayti. And secondly, my family. The people of my house. There's another hadith where he says, Kitab Allah wa Sunnati. And some would say, well, this is a contradiction. Now, the first hadith is much stronger than the second hadith. Itrati is stronger than Sunnati. But is this really a contradiction? We're going to explore that, inshallah ta'ala. And then he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa lan These two things, the Kitab Allah and the Itra of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ahlul they're never going to separate. They're never going to deviate. They're never going to contradict. They're always going to be in alignment. You cannot, in other words, you cannot understand the Quran without Ahlul Bayt. You cannot understand Ahlul Bayt without the Quran. And then the Prophet وسلم, he said, Alastu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim? Am I not more important to the believers than their own selves? Which is a reference to the verse in the Quran, Surah Al Ahzab, ayah number six. And Nabiyu Auladin Mu'minina min Anfusihim. The Prophet is closer to the believers than their own selves. In other words, the believers prefer the life of the Prophet over their own lives. And if you read the story of Husband Ahud, for example, that becomes very, very clear. And they said, Bala, Bala, yes, yes. And then he took the hand of Ali. And he said, Man kuntu Mawla, Bahada Ali yun Mawla. Hadith Mutawatir. If I am your master, then this Ali is your master. Allahumma wali man wala wa adi man ada wa ansur man nasara wa khudul man khadala aw kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam Oh God, befriend the one who befriends Ali and antagonize the one who antagonizes Ali and give victory to the one who gives him victory and forsake the one who forsakes him. Now, the Shia say this is a very clear uh, endorsement of the Prophet وسلم, that Ali is the Khalifa, right? The Sunnis, they put it more into context. The Sayyidina Ali, he was in Yemen at the time of the Hajj and uh, they were returning back and some of his men, they took some spoils that they started to wear, some linens and cloth from Yemen. So Sayyidina Ali said, you cannot divide the spoils, the Hanima, without the Prophet وسلم, so he said, take everything off and put on your old clothes. And this caused a lot of anger amongst the men of Ali. And they started talking bad things about Sayyidina Ali. So the Prophet وسلم, in the context of what's going on here, is exonerating Ali from any type of wrongdoing. Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, were told that the Prophet وسلم, in his final khutbah in the masjid, he said to seal up all the doors of the masjid except the door of Abu Bakr Siddiq. And Imam Suyuti, quoting from Ibn Hajar As-Qalani, says this is a clear endorsement of the caliphate of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Um, so is there a contradiction in these two hadith? 
One says Kitab Allah wa Sunnati, one says Kitab Allah wa There's no contradiction. Because the true and authentic Sunnah of the Prophet the true and authentic Sunnah of the Prophet has always been uh, invested in the Ahlul Bayt. That's what the is. So, the ulama say, Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah, that there's no contradiction in two hadith, that the true and authentic Sunnah has always been invested in the Ahlul Bayt in its Zahir and its Batin aspects. As long as the Ahlul Bayt, these descendants of the Prophet, they implement the Sharia, and obviously they have Iman. It's based on Taqwa, that's the number one thing. Imam al Haddad who was a great scholar of Tarim and Hadramaut, he's Husseini Ahlul Bayt. He says in a poem, La Amruka, Mal insanu ila ibnu dinihi, Falatta truk at Taqwa ittikan and al Nasr, Fakad Rafa al Islamu Salman al Farisin, Wakad Wada al Shirku al Hasiba Abba Laha. He said, By your life, a person is only the son of his religion. So don't forsake Taqwa and lean on your lineage. Taqwa is the most important thing. For verily, Islam did what? Exalted the Persian, Salman. Right? He's not Ahlul Bayt. But the Prophet said what? Salman minna Ahlul Bayt. Salman is an honorary member of Ahlul Bayt. And verily, Shirk debased the high noble birth of the person Abu Lahab, who's from Bani Hashim, the, un the uncle of the Prophet. Another hadith uh, is from Umm Salama, where she says, Ali. And the truth are inseparable. Ali and the truth are inseparable. Ali and the Quran are inseparable. In the hadith of Tabarani and Al-Hakim, the Prophet says, Al-Nadhru ila wajhi aliyin ibadah. Aw kama qala. Ajeeb hadith. That a glance into the face of Ali is an act of worship. There's a hadith called Hadith al-Manzila, which the Prophet says to Ali, Ama tarda an takuna minni bi manziliti Harun min Musa? Are you not pleased that you are to me as Harun is to Musa alayhi salam, except there's no prophet after me? So what is the relationship between Harun and Musa alayhi salam? Harun was his brother, his supporter, his friend, his beloved, the preserver of spiritual secrets, of sacred gnosis, of ma'rifa, right? Secret gnosis. Now, it's interesting because the temporal successor of Musa alayhi salam was not Harun. Who was it? It's Yusha bin Nun. It's the Prophet Joshua. So in this hadith, he's not indicating that Sayyidina Ali is going to inherit the temporal kingdom. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is the Khalifa of the Prophet And he also inherited temp this uh, secret gnosis, spiritual uh, secrets from the Prophet Highest type of knowledge, ma'rifa. That's why many of the turuq, of the tasawwuf, of the uh, mystical aspect or ihsan, they go through Ali or Abu, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu hadith of Safina, it's a very interesting hadith, it's in the Mustadrat of Al-Hakim, Mustad of Ahmad. The Prophet sallallahu said, Mathalu ahli bayti ka mathali safinati nur. Man rakibaha faqad naja, wa man takhallafa anha faqad halak. My, uh, the similitude of my ahli bayt, my family, is like the ship of Noah, of Nuh alayhi salam. Whoever embarks upon it is saved. Whoever does not is ruined. So these are just some hadith, some Quranic ayat. Now we begin the story of the blessed Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam. Imam al Hussein is the son of Ali. He is the son of Fatima, the one about whom the Prophet وسلم, said, "Fatima tu bid'atu minni, faman aghdabani faqat." That Fatima is a piece of my flesh. Whoever has angered her has angered me. And whoever angers me has angered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's look at or analyze this revolutionary stance against tyranny. The stance of Imam Hussein and what it means for liberation theology. The Prophet ﷺ said, Speak the truth even if it's bitter, and don't be afraid of those who find fault 
This epitomizes Imam Hussein. أَفْضَلُ الْجِهَادِ مَنْ قَالَ كَلِمَةَ حَقٍ عِنْدَ سُلْطَانٍ جَائِرٍ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ The greatest type of jihad is a word of truth in the face of an oppressor. This epitomizes Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So Imam Hussein was born in 4 Hijri. He's the second son of Ali and Fatima. He, uh, they say that Imam Hassan looked like the Prophet ﷺ from the neck up. And Imam Hussein السلام, looked like the Prophet ﷺ from the neck down. This is in their khalq, in their physical appearance. The Prophet ﷺ also said in a hadith, which is an amazing hadith of al bazzar Al-Hakim, Al-Tabarani, Hussein on minni wa ana min Hussein. Allahumma ahabba man, ahabba Husseinan. Hussein is uh, from me and I am from Hussein. So we can understand Hussein is from me because Hussein is the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu But how do we understand Wa ana min Hussein and I am from Hussein. So the ulama say that this indicates that the khuluq of Hussein is also similar to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That he looks like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his physicality but also his comportment, his character, his principles, his virtue are aligned with the character, the principles, and the virtues of the Prophet ﷺ as well. Another interpretation of this meaning is that Sayyidina Hussein is the preserver of the Prophet's religion and legacy. The Prophet ﷺ had intense love for his grandchildren. One time the Prophet ﷺ was standing on the minbar giving khutbah for Jum'ah. And Imam Hussein was a toddler and he had wandered into the masjid following the voice of his grandfather. The Prophet I said that he sees his grandson and he descends the minbar and he in the middle of the khutbah and he picks up his grandson and he hugs him. The same body he hugged that would be trampled by horse at Karbala. And then he kisses the face of Imam Hussein. The same face that's attached to the blessed severed head that would be whipped by the stick of Ibn Ziyad and some say Yazid himself. The Prophet ﷺ, he reascends the pulpit, the minbar, and finishes his khutbah holding his grandson in his arms. This is the kind of love that the Prophet ﷺ had for his grandchildren. He used to say, Inna ibni hadha, about Imam Hussein. Indeed, this son of mine. Indeed, this son of mine. Now, as an adult, Imam Hussein lived during a time of major tyranny and massive persecution of Ahlul Bayt. So in Damascus at the time, part of the khutbah liturgy was something called the La'an Ali. Right? And this was state instituted. In other words, you can't give a khutbah in uh, the Umayyad polity unless you send La'ana, curses, on Ali. Like we have Arkan of the khutbah. You have to give Alhamdulillah, As-salaam ala nabi Ittaqullah. There's a few things you have to say in Arabic in every khutbah for the khutbah to be valid according to the different madhahib. One of the things that you had to do in Damascus at this time was send la'ana on Sayyidina Ali alayhi salam. It's ajib. And they used to say, Sawwad Allahu wajha. Sawwad Allahu wajha. May God darken his face. May Allah darken his face. So the Ahl Sunnah started saying, Haram Allahu wajha. May God ennoble his face. And this happened for 90 years in Damascus. The La'an Ali was instituted for 90 years. The Umayyad authorities had secret homeland security agents all across the empire, especially in Iraq, especially in Kufa. Why Kufa? Because when Sayyidina Ali became Khalifa in 656 of the Common Era, he moved the capital of Islam from Medina to Munawwara to Kufa in Iraq. And this gave him a more central position to deal with this growing problem coming out of the north from the Bani Umayyah in Damascus and also put him in a good position to deal with this menacing group of puritanical Muslims who call themselves Al-Khawarij, who are called Al-Khawarij. These are people who believed that they, they were the only ones who had the truth, they were exclusivist and everybody else was a Kafir. And it was a man of Khawarij who eventually killed Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam Sayyuti says, in his tarikh al khulafa that the Prophet ﷺ said to Imam Ali, he said, two people will have the most painful torment in the inferno. The, the fair-skinned man of the people of Salih, the one who killed the Naqatullah, the she, the she camel, and the one who's going to strike you here 
And this, his beard, will be saturated with blood. And this is what happened to Sayyidina Ali as he left the masjid according to Book 40 of Ikhya al uh din Kitabu Dhikr al-Mawt, Wa Ma Ba'da, Imam Ghazali says, when Imam, uh, when Imam Ali was coming out of the masjid in Kufa, this man of the Khawarij, Abdul Rahman, uh, Ibn Muljam al-Muradi pounced on him and cut and striked him with his poison sword on his cranium. It split his skull and immediately blood rushed down his face. And Imam Ali fell back and said, Fuz tu wa rabba al-Ka'aba. Fuz tu wa rabba al-Ka'aba. I have triumphed by the Lord of the Ka'aba. I have won by the Lord of the Ka'aba. So, another hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Ya Ali, la yuhibbuka illa mu'min. He says, nobody loves you except a believer. Nobody is angry with you except a munafiq. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said, Kunna na'rif al-munafiqeen fil madinati bi-bughdihim ali. We used to be able to tell who's a munafiq in Medina because of their hatred for Ali. So the name Ali was very much stigmatized during this time. And it carried with it a political subversion. Nobody would name their son Ali. Right? Because Muawiyah had a difference of opinion with Imam Ali alayhi salam. And if you name your son Ali, it's as if you're agreeing with Ali over Muawiyah. So this was dangerous for people to do. It was seen as politically subversive. It was stigmatized. Imam Hussein, he names four of his sons Ali. Four of his sons, Ali Akbar, Ali Asghar, Ali ibn Hussein, Zainul Abidin. So any type of behavior that was even remotely perceived as subversive by the Umayyad polity was harshly dealt with. Unfortunately, it was part of Umayyad foreign and domestic policy at one point to hunt down and kill the descendants of the Prophet Muhammad This is how pitiful it was. There's a hadith the Prophet says, in the Ibn Hadha Sayyid, about Imam Hassan, that this son of mine is a Sayyid. Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause reconciliation by means of him between two groups of Muslims. So Imam Tirmidhi says in a hadith that the, that the righteous caliphate will last for 30 years. This is a sound hadith. It will last for 30 years. And the Prophet ﷺ, he says in a hadith, عَلَيْكُ بِالسُنَّةِ وَالسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِينَ تَمَسَّكُوا بِهَا وَعَدُّوا عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِدِ Hold fast to my sunnah and the rightly guided caliphs. Hold fast to it. Bite onto it with your molar teeth. أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَةُ وَالسَّلَامُ Hold on to it. So if you add up the caliphates of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, you get 29 years and 6 months. So Imam al Hassan was Khalifa for six months. We shouldn't forget that. That's why Jalaluddin Suyuti, he mentions in his book, Tarif al-Khulafa, that the fifth Khalifa is Imam Hassan. So, the Prophet ﷺ passed on Rabi al-Awwal, 11 Hijri, and Imam Hassan abdicated, relinquished his haq to Muawiyah in Rabi al-Awwal, 41 Hijri. So Muawiyah was the governor of Syria at the time of Uthman's murder. And he wanted Ali to immediately investigate because Muawiyah and Uthman were kinsmen. They're both from Bani Umayyah. He wanted Ali to investigate and find the culprits and to punish them. Imam Ali thought it was prudent not to do that. It's going to divide the empire. In hindsight, Ahlul Sunnah sides with Imam Ali. Salam. But then Muawiyah said, I'm not going to give you bay'ah then. I'm not going to pledge my allegiance to you. And he did not. Neither did Aisha, neither did Zubair, neither did Talha. As Zubair ibn Awam, Talha ibn Ubaidullah, these are from Ashanan Mubashirin ibn Jannah. The Prophet says, Hadith Mutawatir, these two men are in paradise. I mean, but initially, they did not give bay'ah to Ali. This led to the first civil war, the Battle of the Camel in 656 of the Common Era. So Aisha marches out against Ali. And her primary intention was to make Islah bin al Muslimin. This is our opinion of this event. But there were some Sabaites, right, who had attacked the Hodaj of Aisha. 
They attacked her. These are proto Khawarij. So the people of Aisha had no choice but to defend her. So a skirmish began. He sent Aisha back to Medina al Manawara, hosted by her brother, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Now, after this battle, the shirt of Uthman was hanging on the pulpit in Damascus, his blood stained shirt. And that was used as a means by which people would gain some sort of Hamas or this type of zealotry. So Muawiyah was able to raise a huge army. And we have now in 657 of the Common Era the Battle of Safin, which is against, which is Ali against Muawiyah. Now this battle ended in an arbitration, a tahkim, right? And we won't go through all the details of the battle, but basically what happened is that when Ali made arbitration, a large group of his men rebelled against him and said, you're the Khalifa, how dare you make arbitration? You have committed kufr and you are kafir. And these became the Khawarij. So in 659, Sayyidina Ali went to war with the Khawarij at Nahrawan. And there was two groups of Khawarij, the Azraqis and the Najdis. And both of them were puritanical. They believed that any Muslim who even committed a minor sin uh, had become a kafir, apostated, and it was the duty of them to kill that Muslim. So Imam Hassan, he was bothered by Sifin, right? This, this event where Sahaba are fighting Sahaba. He was bothered by it. So in 41 Hijri, he met with Muawiyah and relinquished his haq to spare Muslim blood. 41 Hijri is known as Amul Jama'ah. Amul Jama'ah, the year of unity. But there was a condition. The condition was that the caliphate would return back to him when Muawiyah died. So Imam Hassan at this time was about 40 years old. Muawiyah was around 60. So he says that when you die, it should come back to me. And if not me, then the Ahl al-Bayt. And Muawiyah agreed with this. Now, Muawiyah died in 60 Hijri, when he was around 80 years old. And before he had died, he'd chosen his son, a fellow named Yazid, who was 32 years old at the time, to be the next Khalifa. And Muawiyah justified the decision by saying that Syria had the strongest army and its strength was proper for the caliphate, to re retain the power of the caliphate. And besides, Hassan had already died by this time. So according to Imam Suyuti, Yazid uh, told one of the wives of Imam Hassan, whose, whose name was Ja'ada, poison Hassan, poison him, and then I'll be caliph, and then I'll marry you, and you can be the wife of a caliph. So that's what she did. Imam Hassan, alayhi salam, passed away, and then Yazid did not marry her. And he got rid of Imam Hassan. There's even some scholars of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, just to mention this, that say that the poisoning was instigated by Muawiyah. Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi says, no, uh, the evidence for that is uh, lacking. Allahu <clears throat> alam. Now, according to both Sunni and Shi'i sources, Muawiyah had stipulated in his final will, directed towards his son, that if Imam Hussein does not give you bay'ah, you have to just let it go. Don't pursue it. You have to overlook it. Don't force the issue. And the question is why? And the, and the, and the answer is because Muawiyah, was a very astute politician, and he knew that that was going to be difficult to force Imam Hussein, a man of great principle, to make bay'ah to his son Yazid. And also, he did not make bay'ah to Ali. So he's thinking, I did not make bay'ah to his father, why do I expect Ali's son to make bay'ah to my son? Right? So don't expect that from him. That was Muawiyah's condition uh, on Yazid. But Yazid had some ego issues. Right? Some would call him a despotic tyrant. He is a pharaonic archetype. Many of the Ahlul uh, Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the ulama, they make takfir of Yazid. They say he's a kafir. That's a valid opinion from Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. At least he was an open facet. When I say he's a pharaonic archetype, I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm making takfir of him. I'm saying he has some attributes of the pharaon. 
Just like many of our despotic Muslim leaders in the Middle East, they're still Muslim, they claim to be Muslim, we can't say they're not Muslim, but they have these attributes of the Fir'aun. Besides, uh, Yazid, according to Imam Suyuti, poisoned Imam Hassan. After the Battle of Karbala, he attacked Medina to al He killed many Ahlul Bayt and took their women as uh, slaves. He also attacked Mecca and killed Abdullah ibn Zubair and his group of men. And then he catapulted stones into the Kaaba and destroyed the Kaaba. This is what he did. Um, so it's interesting when we read a description of the Pharaoh in the Quran. And think of this description in terms of Yazid and Karbala and Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, In the Fir'aun ala fil'ar. That the Fir'aun has exalted himself in the earth. وَجَعَلَ أَهْلَهَا shia. And he's made its people under his dominion into different denominations and sections. Right? This is what the Fir'aun does. And according to the tafsir, what he does is he sends these agents into the people to sow these seeds of corruption and discord. Fitna. Right? And then he gets them to fight each other. And then he sits back and says, I didn't do anything. These people are fighting each other. I'm innocent. Washes his hands of it. And then Allah says, And then he takes a group, a ta'ifa, of the people that he's oppressing. And the tafsir says, the group that he fears the most rebellion from, with respect to Fir'aun, is Bani Israel. Because Bani Israel at the time, there were traditions of a deliverer, a savior, Musa alayhi was going to come, he's going to defeat the Pharaoh. And Pharaoh knows about this. He knows, he understands the rhetoric. So with respect to Yazid, it's the Ahl al-Bayt of the Prophet ﷺ. He fears rebellion, losing his power. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us uh, specifically how does he oppress this ta'ifa. يُذَبِّحُ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ He kills their men. He hunts them down and he kills their men. وَيَسْتَحْيِي نِسَاءَهُمْ And he leaves their women alive. All right, so now those women are dependent upon the very system that murdered their men. In the Hukana min al He is of those who seek corruption or sow corruption in the earth. So just as Musa alayhi salam speaks truth to power, Imam Hussain alayhi salam is going to speak truth to power. And it's not real power. There's no real power with Qur'an. There's no real power with Yazid. There's a story in the Quran in Surah Ghafir, which we are told that there's a, a, a male believer from the Ali Fir'aun. This is not Asya, his wife. She was a believer, there's no doubt about it. Some of the Ashari theologians say she was even a prophet. The Quran says, min Ali Fir'aun, a, a male from his close family that was Muslim. And he advises Fir'aun. He says, Ya qawmi, lakumul mulkul yawma zahirina fil this day, the mulk, the dominion is yours, apparently. Apparently. But in reality, bil haqiqati, all dominion. Walillahi mulku samawati wa Everything is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't be deceived by outward numbers and appearances. Now getting back to the story. At this point, a letter arrives in Medina from Damascus. And it's addressed... Uh, to the governor of Medina. And his name is Al-Walid bin Utba. And Al-Walid, he tells one of his deputies, whose name is Marwan Al-Hakam. And Marwan does not like Imam Ali at all. And he actually was going around Medina to Manawara cursing Imam Ali. So this letter says, it's coming from Damascus, it's saying that Muawiyah has died and Yazid is Khalifa. And you need to force four men in, in Medina to make bay'ah. Now, obviously, everyone in the ummah doesn't have to make bay'ah for the caliphate to be legitimate. Only high-ranking people, famous people, right? So these four, the letter says, you have to make sure they give bay'ah to Yazid. All right? And, you, and how you're going to do that? They're going to give their hand to Marwan, and then through the hand of Marwan, it's going to represent their bay'ah to Yazid. So these four men... It says two of them are going to give you a little bit of issues. Who are these two? Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Umar. And then there's other two that are going to give you a lot of issues. Abdullah ibn Zubair 
and Al Hussein ibn Ali. And it says, but this last person, Hussein, if he does not give you bay'ah, then bring his head to me. Bring back his head to Damascus. So they say, what do you think about that? To Imam Hussein. And he says, give me a delay. And they say, you have till Fajr time. And they say to Ibn Zubair, what do you think about that? He says, give me a delay. So you have till Fajr time. So Imam Hussein, he gathers some members of his family and his companions, and they prepare to leave Medina to Munawwara. And they go where? To Mecca. Reverse Hijrah. Reverse Hijrah. Right? And we're told by the ulama that the Mahdi will also flee from Medina into Mecca as a fugitive. So the future Mahdi. So Imam Hussein and Abdullah ibn Zubair, they go into Mecca together. Now, <clears throat> he stays in Mecca for four months, seeking refuge in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And during this time, a flood of letters from all over the Muslim world come into Mecca. Because now they know that Imam Hussein has left Medina, he's in Mecca. Especially from Iraq, and especially from Kufa. Letters come into Imam Hussein from the Kufans, saying, your father's capital was in Kufa. We love your father. Come be our leader. Come be our Khalifa. We'll begin a revolution. Right? We'll stand up against the injustice and the oppression and the tyranny of Yazid. And they knew that Imam Hussein would never pledge allegiance to an open facet. Yazid at least was an open facet. Again, many of Ahlul Sunnah make takfir of Yazid. They say what he did was enough to say that he was not Muslim. At least an open facet. He used to drink alcohol in public. Did some ajib and harib types of things. He had a pet monkey that he would parade around on his horse. His monkey died. He did janazah over the monkey. This type of 32-year-old man. Yeah. Very strange. There's actually a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu which Shaykh Muhammad Nidwi, he quotes a lot. He says it's Sahih Hadith. Where he says, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, The first person to change my ummah, uh, change my sunnah, is a man from Bani Umayyah. And we're not saying that all of the Bani Umayyah are bad or evil. There's awliya from them. There's salihin from them. But this is the Muslim polity at the time, the Bani Umayyah. So we have to remember something. Again, the reality of the Sunnah has always been invested in the Ahlul Bayt. This is how we, this is how we uh, reconcile those two hadith. Kitab Allah wa Itra and Kitab Allah wa Sunnah. When we talk about Sunnah, we're talking about Itra. They're synonymous. The Prophet Sallallahu says in a hadith of Bayhaqi, Man tamassaka bi sunnati and the fasadi ummati falahu ajru mi'ati shaheed in Bayhaqi. Whoever holds fast to my Sunnah during the time of the corruption of my ummah, will have the reward of 100 martyrs. So when he says sunnah, we have to think of itra, because they're used interchangeably. This is called tafsir bil riwaya. Right? The same word is used to explain the other. In Bukhari and Muslim, man raqiba an sunnati falaysa minni. Whoever turns away from my sunnah is not from me. Whoever turns away from my sunnah, whoever turns away from my itra, ahlil bayt, is not from me. This is how we understand the hadith. Tafsir bin Riwayah. Just turning away from the Sunnah. What about those who, and turning away from the Itra? What about those who oppress the Itra, the Ahlul Bayt? What about those who hunt them down and massacre them? The Prophet says, فَلَيْسَ minni, Husaynun minni, wa ana min Husayn. It's an ajib hadith. Really unbelievable statement. The Prophet says, Fatima to bid'atu minni. Fatima is for me. Aliun, there's actually a hadith. Aliun minni. Another hadith, Inna Dina Bada Hariba. This religion started strange. Fasayarunu Kama Bada. Fatuba Dil Huraba. This religion started strange and it will again return to be something strange. So glad tidings to the strangers. Who are those? Those who repair what people have corrupted from my sunnah. Again, when we say sunnah, we have to think of itra, of Ahlul Bayt. So it's very, very important. Now, while in Mecca, Imam Hussein, he sends a deputy, who's his cousin, named Muslim bin Aqil, into Kufa to investigate. Right? To investigate. So he wants to know, go into Kufa, 
But be very careful and find out if what they're saying is true. Is this a ruse? Is this a trick of some sort? Are they trying to uh, uh, frame me and trap me? So he sends Muslim bin Aqil into Kufa. Now Muslim stayed in the house of a man named Hani bin Urwa. He's in the house of a man named Hani bin Urwa. And in the house of Hani, 18,000 men, 18,000 men, they make bay'ah to Hussein through Muslim bin Aqil. 18,000 men pledged their allegiance to Imam Hussein. Now, at this point, Imam Hussein, he writes a letter, uh, I'm sorry, Muslim bin Aqil, he writes a letter, a correspondence to Imam Hussein, saying, you should now come to Kufa. What we heard was true. These people have everything ready for you. They're going to welcome you as their leader. We're going to stand up against the oppressor, and so on and so forth. Now, there's some Kufans, because they couldn't keep this under wraps, 18,000 people going to a house over a few days. It cannot be kept a secret. They learn of what's going on, some of the Kufans, and they want nothing to do with it, and it, and it frightens them. So they go to the governor of Kufa, whose name is Nu'man bin Bashir, and they say to Nu'man, you know this man, Muslim bin Aqil, he came from Mecca, he was sent by Imam Hussein, he's here taking bay'ah on behalf of Imam Hussein. 18,000 men have made bay'ah. And if Yazid figures this out, and if the Umayyad authorities figure this out, then we're all dead. You need to do something about this. This is what they tell Nu'man bin Bashir, the governor of Kufa. But Nu'man does nothing. He does nothing. Because he's afraid of Imam Hussein. The Prophet says, Irqubu, I'm sorry, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he says, Irqubu Muhammadan fi ahli baytihi. He says, be extremely vigilant about Muhammad وسلم, with respect to his family. Be extremely vigilant. Be very, very cautious. So, Nu'man bin Bashir thinks it's prudent to do nothing about the situation. So the people of Kufa, who have issues with this, they write a letter to Yazid in Damascus. And Yazid learns about this, and he writes a letter to the governor of Basra. The governor of Basra was a ruthless man named Ubaid Allah ibn Ziyad. And he orders Ibn Ziyad to go to Kufa to investigate. So Ibn Ziyad, he comes into Kufa, and his face is completely wrapped. And he comes into the city, and somebody sees him and says, Marhaban, Ya Ibn Rasulillah, Marhaban, Ya Aba Abdillah. So they thought this is Imam Hussein. So Ibn Ziyad says, Aha! So they do expect Imam Hussein to come into the city. So he goes and he sets up in this palace in Kufa. And during this time as well, we should mention, Yazid from Syria, from Damascus, he dispatches secret agents into Mecca to find Imam Hussein, to assassinate Imam Hussein. Ibn Ziyad now in Kufa, he pays one of his subjects 3,000 dinars to go find out where is this house of Bayah. Where are these people making bay'ah, these 18,000 people? Go investigate further. He gives this man 3,000 dinars. So this man, however, he does it. He bribes someone, he asks questions, he throws money at people. However, he does it, he's able to find the house and identify the man. He said, this is the house of Hani bin Urwa. This is where people are making uh, bay'ah. So Ibn Ziyad, he calls for Hani into the palace, and he has him beaten and tortured. Now, Muslim bin Aqil, he's at the house of Hani at this point, and he's able to muster an army of 5,000 men, and they lay siege to the house, to the palace of Ibn Ziyad. 5,000 men, where Hani is being tortured. Ibn Ziyad at this point, he relates a message down to the men on the floor through his officers, and he says to them that a huge army from Syria is en route right now, from Yazid, and all of you are dead. Leave now or you're dead. So he intimidates them. Also, he bribes many of the men. Right? So he says to them, you know, Ibn Ziyad is now the governor of Kufa. This man, Nu'man bin Bashir, he's gone. He's now the governor. Do you want a, a high position in his cabinet? So yes, here's some dinars. Now go away. So they bribe many of the men as well. Musa bin Aqil at Zuhur time, he led a congregation of 5,000 men. 
At Asa time, it was 30 men. And by Maghrib time, there was nobody left with him. Everyone had gone. So he flees. And he quickly writes a letter to Imam Hussein, who is in Mecca. And he says, basically, forget it. It's all bad. Don't come into Kufa. Right? So now, in Mecca, it's Hajj season. And these agents of Yazid, they come into Mecca. They're wearing ihram. And they have weapons underneath their ihram. They have daggers underneath their ihram. People coming into Mecca at the Kaaba to kill the grandson of the Prophet The Imam, he cuts his hajj short and he decides to leave Mecca. And the question is, why does he decide to leave Mecca? He receives a letter. It's all bad. Don't come to Kufa. But he's leaving Mecca. The reason is because, the ulama say, the second thaqal cannot violate the first thaqal. The second weight can never violate the first weight. The itra can never violate the Qur'an. Thaqalain. Allah says, وَمَنْ دَخَلَهُ كَانَ amina." Whoever enters the house is safe. So in order to preserve the sanctity of Mecca, the sanctity of the Kaaba, the Imam sets off into the desert, knowing his fate. Sets off into the desert. The date is 8 Dhul Hijjah, 60 Hijri. And he takes women and children. Why take women and children? He knows his fate. Why take women and children? The ulama say because the Ummah was sleeping. And Imam Hussein wanted to wake it up. To shock the Ummah, as it were, out of its ghafla, out of its heedlessness and complacency. The sunnah is being changed. The Ahl al-Bayt are being hunted down and killed. If he had only taken the men, if he had only taken the men, because the Ummawi propaganda machine was very powerful, if he had only taken the men and went out in the desert, the men of Yazid would have slaughtered all of the men, buried them, and they would have said something like, yeah, it was unfortunate. You know, it, he... He attacked us, we defended ourselves, there was a skirmish, and unfortunately Imam Hussein, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he, he got killed, and you know, it's, it's very unfortunate. They would have told the story, right? But you take women and children, who were, who were the ones that ultimately told the story of Karbala? The women and children. They told the truth about what actually happened. Like Asayda to Zayna, in the court of Yazid in Damascus, speaking truth to power. Now, meanwhile, in Kufa, Muslim bin Aqil is eventually captured. And he's also taken to the palace of Ibn Ziyad. And he's also tortured. And Hani and Muslim bin Aqil are both decapitated. And their bodies are dragged through the streets. And there's one report that says that the body of Muslim was crucified upside down headless. This was a scare tactic from Ibn Ziyad to the rest of the people of Kufa. Now Ibn Ziyad, he sends another man named Hur Ibn Yazid. This is a different Ibn Yazid. It's not Yazid of Ibn uh, Muawiyah uh, or the son of Muawiyah. Hur. He's called Hur Ibn Yazid or Hur At-Tamimi. So Ibn Ziyad sends him with 1,000 soldiers to go to Imam Hussein and give him the Order that you are not allowed to come into Kufa. He says, just prevent him. He's not saying go kill him, go massacre. He says, don't let him come into Kufa. This is his order. This is the order of Ibn Ziyad to Hur bin Yazid and his 1,000 men. So Hur goes out and he meets Imam Hussein. And he says to Imam Hussein, uh, who's already in Iraq, somewhere in Iraq. He's left Mecca, he's in southern Iraq somewhere. He says, Imam Hussein, you need to go back to Mecca. And Imam Hussein says, I'm not going back to Mecca. So, no, you need to go back to Mecca. These are the orders. He says, I'm not going back to Mecca. I'm not going to be slaughtered in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am the son of Ali and Fatima, my grandfather of the Prophet. You're going to order me to go back to Mecca? And then Imam Hussein loses his patience with the man and he says, May your mother lose you. Which is a way of saying, What, are you kidding me? And then Hur is taken aback by this. And he's thinking about it. And he says, you know, if any other man said that to me, I would kill him on the spot. But I'm thinking to myself, what can I say about your mother? What can I say about Fatima Zahra? 
I can't say anything. Suddenly he changes a little bit. There's a different demeanor to Hur. Right? And now it goes from commanding him, go back to Mecca, to pleading with him. Ya Imam, please I beg you, go back to Mecca. It's going to be all bad in Kufa. Go back to Mecca. And Imam Hussein says, no, I'm not going to go back to Mecca. So there's 70 kilometers from Kufa at this point. And Imam Hussein says, what is this place called? And Hora says, Karbala. And he says, Naam, hada karb wa bala. Karb means disaster in Arabic. Bala means tribulation. Disaster in tribulation. So eventually, now, Ibn Ziyad, he sends another 4,000 soldiers into the desert. And now the leader of this squadron is a man named Umar ibn Sa'd. Umar ibn Sa'd. Who is Sa'd? He's the son of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas. He's a great companion of the Prophet. His father Sa'd defended the Prophet at Uhud. His father said to Sa'd, Fidaka Abi wa Ummi. Ya Sa'd. Irmi ya Sa'd. Fidaka Abi wa Ummi. Throw your arrows. May my father and mother be your ransom. This is what the Prophet said to Sa'd. Ibn Abi Waqqas. Now his son Umar is leading a group of 4,000 soldiers to go out against Imam Hussein. So he meets Imam Hussein at Karbala. And Imam Hussein, uh, they have negotiations. And Imam Hussein says, okay, uh, I'll, I'll give you three options. They say, what? He says, I'll go back to Mecca, number one. He has no intention of going back to Mecca. Number two, I'll go straight to Damascus and make bay'ah to Yazid. He has no intention of doing that. Or I'm going to go into one of these neighboring provinces or townships and fight fi sabilillah. But I won't go to Kufa. You don't want me to go to Kufa? I won't go to Kufa. So Ibn Taz is great. Beautiful. So he sends a correspondence back to Ibn Ziyad and Kufa. And Ibn Ziyad says, that's beautiful. That's a great idea. We accomplished our plan. But there's a hothead in Kufa who's from the advisors of Ibn Ziyad. And his name is Shimr Ibn Dil Jawshan. And Shimr says, ha, what are you kidding me? He's dictating to us? He's our prisoner. He's a, he's a rebel. This is what we have to do. Bring him into Kufa and we'll decide what to do with him. Don't give him this option. How dare he dictate to us? Who does he think he is? Who does he think he is? Hussein on Minni wa Anam and Hussein. Who is Shimr? Man Shimr. Ladri. So then Ibn Ziyad is convinced. Oh, it's a good, great idea. But he tells Shimr, you have to deliver this personally to Ibn Sa'ad in Karbala. So he sends Shimr into Karbala. And Shimr says to Ibn Sa'ad, he says, the deal is off. You have to bring Imam Hussein and all of his family members and companions as prisoners into Kufa. This is your only option. If Ibn Sa'ad says, no, he's not going to agree to this. And neither will I. Neither will I. So then Shimr says, Ibn Ziyad also said, if you don't agree with it, he's not going to give you the governorship of Ray, of a place called R-A-Y-Y. -Y. Ray, a beautiful place in Iraq. He's not going to give it to you. He's going to give it to me, to Shimr. Right? So Ibn Sa'ad, he says, no, I, I want to be the governor. Okay, fine. So he goes to Imam Hussein. And he says, yeah, Imam, uh, there's no deal here. We'll take you back to Kufa as a prisoner. And Imam Hussein says, prisoner? You want, you're going to take me back to Kufa with Ahil Bayt as a prisoner? I'm the son of Ali. I'm the son of Fatima. I'm the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You're going to take me back as a prisoner? He says, no, there's no deal. And the Ibn Sa'id says, there's no other option. This is your final offer. And Imam Hussein says, there's one other option. He says, what is it? No, Fatima, we're going to fight. This is what's going to happen. So suddenly, and during this time, these 5,000 men or amongst Imam Hussein and his people, Imam Hussein is leading everyone in prayer. He's leading these men in prayer. He's their Imam. And when he says, Nubatilu, suddenly, the people start separating. And they start separating. And Hur, he goes to Ibn Sa'id. And he says, whoa, whoa, are you kidding me? There's 72 of them. There's 5,000 of us. We're soldiers. We're going to fight now? He says, yes. He says, no, we just let him go to a township. He said, no, we're not going to, we can't. Ibn Ziyad said, we can't do that. 
So Hoda says, I am not going to attack Imam Hussein. So he changes sides. And he goes over to Imam Hussein and he says, I pledge my allegiance to you. Hora ibn Yazid at Tamimi now becomes a person of Din Pana has Hussein. Saradat Nadat Das Das the Yazid. He says, Hussein is king, Hussein is emperor, Hussein is religion, Hussein is the hope of religion. He did not give his hand into the hand of Yazid, he gave his head. So there are numerous hadith that are sound hadith from the Prophet that are prophesizing this event. There's one hadith in the Mustadrak of Al Hakim, Sahih Hadith, which Umm Sulama relates. The Prophet was one time sleeping in her quarters, and suddenly, he woke up suddenly and he was very disturbed by something. And then he went back to sleep. And then again he woke up, went back to sleep. And then again, a third time. And then she said, He woke up again and in his hand was some red soil. This sound hadith in the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim. There's some red soil in his hand. And he's kissing it. So she says, what is this? And, she, and he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I've received disastrous news. This son of mine, Hussein, from Jibreel Alayhi Salaam, this son of mine, Hussein, is going to be slaughtered at a place called Karbala. And Jibreel Alayhi Salaam brought me some of the soil of the place, and I was kissing it. This is a sound hadith. Another hadith in the Musnad of Abu Ya'la, and there's different versions of, in Ahmad and Bazaar, that Abdullah ibn Nujay heard from his father, Nujay, that he was traveling with Imam Ali to Safin for the Battle of Safin. And Imam Ali was passing by the banks of the Euphrates River. And he started saying loudly, Sabran ya Aba Abdullah. Sabran ya Aba Abdullah. Imam Ali is saying this. And then Nujay says, what does that mean? What are, you, what are you talking about? And then Ali says that when the Prophet Sallallahu was in Medina, I once walked into his house and I saw him in the corner of the room with tears streaming down his face. And I said, what's wrong, O Messenger of God? And he said that Jibreel has descended upon me and said that this son of mine, Imam Hussein, is going to be slaughtered on the banks of the Euphrates River. So Imam Ali, as he's passing to go to Safin, he's passing by the banks of the Euphrates River. He says, Sabran, Ya Aba Abdullah, patience, O father of Abdullah, patience, O Hussein. This is what he's saying. Another hadith of Tabarani, related by Abu Umama, which we are told that the Prophet ﷺ was informed by Jibreel salam that this ummah, your ummah, will kill the son of yours. And the Prophet said, believing in me? And Jibreel ﷺ said, yes. And he brought some soil to the Prophet ﷺ from this place called Karbala. Imam Ghazali relates in the Ihya al Madin, Book 40, that Ibn Abbas uh, woke up from a dream and said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Laqad qutil al Hussein. We are uh, for God and to God is our return. Verily, Hussein has been killed. And they asked him, what does that mean? And he said, I had a dream. The Prophet ﷺ came to me. He's holding a vial of blood and said, this is the blood of Hussein and his companions at Karbala. 24 days later, Imam Hussein was killed at Karbala. Now back to the scene here and Karbala. So for several days, the army of Yazid tried to force an allegiance from Hussein. How did they try to do it? By cutting off the water supply, which is another tactic of the Pharaoh's military industrial complex. In other words, if you don't agree with us, you don't eat. If you don't agree with us, you don't drink. We're going to cripple your economy. This is what the tyrant does, because the tyrant fears what? Alternative power models. This is what the Quraysh did to the Prophet Sallallahu in Mecca. The Muqata, the boycott and sanctions against Bani Hashim. Threw them out in the desert. Don't trade with them. Don't marry from them. Right? This type of torture or cruelty. But they don't call it torture. They call it sanctions. Sounds better, doesn't it? These are sanctions. It's not massacre. It's collateral damage. Much better sounding. It's part of a shock and awe campaign. So the date is now 10th Muharram, 61 Hijri, Yomi Ashura. Yomi Ashura is tomorrow. It's be, actually began already because it began at Maghrib time. The 10th of Muharram. The Prophet Sallallahu when he went into Medina, he noticed that Yahud, the Jews, were fasting on Yomi Ashura. He said, why are you fasting? 
And he said, this is a day to commemorate the exodus of Bani Israel from Misr, from Egypt. And at that time, the Hebrew calendar, which is also a lunar calendar, 354 days, was perfectly in line with the Arab calendar, right? The Muslim calendar. But then over time, the Jews started adding a leap month every three or four years. That's why Hanukkah never gets out of December. It should fall back like Ramadan does, right, every year. But it's always somewhere in December because they had a leap month. And this is forbidden in the Quran to do that. Don't mess around with the calendar. So this day, at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu right, the 10th of Muharram is the 10th day of the first month. The 10th day of the first month of the Hebrew calendar is called Asarabi Tishri, also known as Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. This is the holiest day in the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So he said, this is why we're fasting. So on this day, there's many things we don't have time to go into specifics, and it's very painful to go into some of these specifics. But Ali Akbar, the son of Imam Hussein, 14 years old, uh, was martyred. Ali Azhar, who was six months old, Imam Hussein, towards the end of the battle, he presented his six-month-old child to the army and said, because they were cutting off the water supply, this, this child of mine is dying of thirst. Can you just give some water to my child? When we slaughter animals, we give them to drink. When we slaughter animals, we give them to drink. You haven't given us water? Give water to this six-month-old child of mine. And a man named Haramala, at the behest of Ibn Sa'd, fired an arrow into the neck of Ali Azhar, six months old. Imam Hussein buried him at Karbala. Zayn al-Abidin, also the son of Imam Hussein, who was 20 years old, he survived the massacre. He was sick. He was in the tent of uh, his aunt, Zainab. He was sick. They spared him. All of the Alawi Sadat come from Zayn al-Abidin. If, no, if Zayn al-Abidin was killed, there's no Imam al-Haddad, al-Faqi al-Muqaddam, Abu Bakr bin Salam, Habib Ali Jafri, Habib, Habib Umar bin Hafid. None of these would have happened. Right? This man, Zayn al-Abidin, was spared from Karbala. He was sick in his bed. They spared him. Abbas, who was the half-brother of Imam Hussein, he made an attempt to get water from the Euphrates. Both of his arms were uh, severed. And then finally he was killed as well. Hur al-Tamimi, the man who turned to Imam Hussein, he was martyred as well. Abu Bakr bin Ali, a son of Ali. Ali had a son named Abu Bakr. This is really important. Because some would say there's enmity between Sahaba. Right? That Abu Bakr and Ali had enmity. There was hatred. They didn't like each other. Because one stole the haq of the other one. This is what some people say. Ali named one of his sons Abu Bakr. He died at Karbala. Ali had another son named Uthman who died at Karbala. The children of Muslim bin Aqil, Muslim who was killed at Kufa, three of his children killed at Karbala. Abu Bakr, the son of Hassan, Imam Hassan had a son, Abu Bakr, he was killed at Karbala. Ja'far, Imam Ali had a son named Ja'far, he was killed at Karbala. The children of Ja'far, the women, Zainab, Sukaina, Fatima, etc., they were all taken into custody. As for Shimr, Shimr is the one who dealt the blow to Imam Hussein salam, that killed him. The ulama say that the maharun nar, maharun nar, what does mahar mean? A dowry. The dowry of hell is the head of Imam Hussein. This is what the ulama say. The man who decapitated Imam Hussein. There is a hadith in the books of the Shafi'is, which is of dubious nature, but it's an interesting hadith that they quote. Which the Prophet is reported to have said, Qatilul Husseini fi tabut min nar, alayhi nisfu adabi ahdi dunya. The killer of Hussein, the Qatil of Hussein, is in a coffin in the fire. Upon him is half of the punishment of all of the people of dunya. Imagine all the people of the, all the people that go to Jahannam. Half of all of that punishment is on a single man. Qatilul Hussein. The main point here is that the ta'ziyah, or the passion narrative, if you will, of Hussein, is metamorphic, it's meta-historical. The Shia say every day is Ashura, and every land is Karbala. Right? You probably heard this. This is true. There's truth in this. Liberation theologian Hamid Dabashi, he says the army of Yazid is a floating signifier. Imam Hussein is anyone who says no to tyranny and injustice, and Shimr and Yazid is any militant thug who murders, rapes, tortures, invades, and colonizes. So in this sense, Malcolm X, radiallahu is a Husseini archetype, a man who stood up against racism and oppression 
during a time it was very difficult to do so. Martin Luther King, who's not Muslim, he's a Husseini archetype. He has the characteristics of Imam Hussein, who stood up against uh, this terrorism. Birmingham, Alabama, in the 1960s, was known as Bombingham. Why? Because white people were bombing black people all the time. Bombingham, Alabama, the center of the white Al-Qaeda, white terrorism. Birmingham, Alabama, 1963, the 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed. Four black girls in the basement, incinerated, killed. Rachel Corey, who stood in front of an Israeli tank to protect a Palestinian home. She is a Husseini archetype. So Imam Hussein sacrificed his life to set this trans-historical example, not to vicariously atone for our sins, as in Christianity, but rather to give us an example, a virtuous example, as to how to live our lives. So it's just a few things about the aftermath, and then we'll stop, inshallah ta'ala. So the tents were all burned by the army of Yazid. The women of Ahl Bayt all wore naqab. The naqab was taken off and the hijab was taken off, ripped off the hijab. The heads of all the men that were slain were taken off. The body of Ali Asghar was exhumed, six months old. His head was, he was decapitated. The, uh, they put the heads on spears and they marched into Kufa and paraded around the city of Kufa in this big procession. The women had no saddles on their camels and they had no shade to, to protect them from the heat. And as Zainab passed by the people of Kufa, some of them were laughing and she said, you laugh now, but just wait. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has taken our men as shuhada. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has taken our men as shuhada. And then on, the, on route to Damascus, they would stop at every city and they would do this procession, this parade. This is what happens when you go against Yazid. They came into Damascus. <clears throat> there are Sahaba in Damascus that are completely horrified by this, obviously. So a Sahabi named Sa'ad ibn Sa'ad, he sees this procession coming in. He sees Zain al-Abidin, the only male survivor. He's tied to a horse. So he approaches him and he says to him, is there anything I can do for you? And he says, do you have any money? And he says, yes. And Zain al-Abidin says, pay some of these soldiers so that the women can wear their hijabs. Just have them wear niqab, wear their hijabs. Pay them off, give them something. And that's what he does. Zayn al-Abidin now stands at the entrance of the Umayyad Masjid and he's, his hands are shackled. An old man comes out of the masjid. Old man, old, white beard. He has a mark of sajda on his head. He sees Zayn al-Abidin and he says, Alhamdulillah al-ladhi nasara amir al-mu'mineen yazid alaykum ya ayyuh al-khawarij. He says, praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave victory to amir al-mu'mineen yazid over you. Oh, you seceders, you dissemblers, you khawarij. This is what he says to Zayn al-Abidin. And Zayn al-Abidin says, Mada fiyadik? What is in your hand? He says, Kitab Allah. He's holding a mushaf. Kitab Allah. And Zayn al-Abidin says, Have you ever heard Allah say in his book, Say, no reward do I ask of you for this except that you love the qurba? He says, Naam, of course I've heard this. He says, Nahnu qurba. We are that qurba that you're supposed to love. And then he says, haven't you heard Allah say, Innama yuridu Allahu al-yuthiba anku al-rijza ahl al-bayt? Wa yutahhirukum tathira? He says, Naam, of course I've heard this. He says, Nahnu ahl al-bayt. We are that ahl al-bayt. They say, Imam, eventually Yazid, he sends uh, Zayn al-Abidin back to Medina. Right? And he lived several more years, and he had these indentations on his cheeks, right here, these permanent indentations on his cheeks. He was constantly weeping over what happened in Karbala. So one of his servants said to him, uh, isn't it about time for you to get over what happened? Right? So Zayn al-Abidin, he's trying to make him feel better, the intention is good. Isn't it about time to get over? He said, you know, Yaqub thought he had lost Yusuf, and he almost went blind. He thought he had lost Yusuf. I saw my father, my cousins, my brothers slaughtered in my presence, the women of the Ahlul Bayt taken as prisoners. Should I not weep till now? Right? 
So the blessed head was brought in the sight of Yazid. And Yazid, he says something very interesting. He says, Al Harabu Sijal, Hade Yom Li Badrin. This is who said this. His grandfather, Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, right after Ghazwan Uhud, Abu Sufyan at that time was not Muslim. He goes up to Jabal Uhud, the Prophet is perched on top of the mountain, and he says, Al Harabu Sijal, Hade Yom Li Badrin. War is attrition. This day for Badr. You wanted Badr, we won now. This is what Yazid says when the head is brought to Imam Hussein. And then he takes a stick and he starts hitting the lips of Imam Hussein with the stick. And Anas ibn Malik is in the majlis. Anas ibn Malik. And he cannot take it. He stands up and says, Woe unto you. Wallahi laqad ra'aytu Rasulallahi yuqabbilu had al He says, Wallahi, I saw the mouth of the messenger touch that mouth. And now you're hitting it with a stick. Right? So, eventually, like we said, Yazid would send everyone back. There was pressure on him to send everyone back. The last thing I'll say is a statement from Ibrahim al nakhai Ibrahim al nakhai was a great scholar of Kufa who came a little bit later. He's one of the teachers of Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa was also from Kufa, born in 70 Hijri, about nine years after the massacre of Kalbala. Ibrahim al nakhai said, he said, if I was one of those men who killed Hussein at Karbala and I, and I somehow made it to paradise, okay, if I was one of those men who killed Hussein and I somehow made it to paradise, I would avoid the Prophet in paradise. I would avoid him. I would be too ashamed to look at the Prophet says in paradise. Right? So what do we learn from this story? We learn many lessons. Imam Hussein is a paragon of courage, <clears throat> of fortitude, of temperance, that we have to speak the truth even if it's bitter. We have to be principled people. We have to do what is right. And, and I've already spoken way too much. Thank you for listening. Um, if there are any comments or questions, we can entertain them. I don't know what time we're supposed to get out. But if there's anything that's pressing, uh, we can do that now, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah khairan. So do you Yeah, some of the ulama do mention that, that those who were directly involved in his murder um, were eventually uh, killed as well um, in skirmishes between uh, some elements of Ahlul Bayt and the Bani Umayya. Um, so this is not this battle in no way ended the Bani Umayya's persecution of the Ahlul Bayt. There was many, many skirmishes, many would-be revolutions against them. Imam Zaid, uh, who's championed by the Zaidi Shia, right? So these are uh, this the uh, the Fiver Shia. Imam Zaid, uh, he was uh, um, captured and killed by the Umayyads. And um, he was, his body was exhumed and then crucified as well. And it was left up for four months on a cross as an example. So this type of I mean, uh, mentality is just... Um, but yeah, there, the Ulama do mention things like that. Uh, I have heard that as well. That those who were directly involved in the murder of Imam Hussein were also uh, killed um, in the same type of way in battle. Yes? So, um question is that where where did actually the, the Shia start and where did that divide start? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, there was a group in Kufa uh, that called himself Jaysh al-Tawabin after the massacre. Jaysh al-Tawabin means the army of the repentant ones. And they would start to wear black and they would start to, to self-mortify themselves. They would start to whip themselves and things like that because they were in a state of repentance, that they had forsaken Imam Hussein, that they had made bay'ah, and then they were paid off or they were intimidated by Ibn Ziyad. So that, that could be a possible starting point uh, of them. The origins of the Shia obviously go back uh, to the successorship of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. During the time of Imam Ali, there was a group called Shi'at Ali and Shi'a Mu'awiyah. 
But this Shia Ali was a political faction. We shouldn't confuse that with the present day Ithna Asharia, you know, Twelver Shiism. Twelver Shiism was not codified until much, much later. Okay, so these were political distinctions. Uh, again, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah today, most, the vast majority, if not all of the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah will say that in retrospect, Shia Ali was right over Shia Muawiyah, but that doesn't mean we have to become Shia, if not Sharia Shia, right? Um, and then there's problems with the Ja'fari school of thought as well. Uh, the, the school was not preserved correctly according to Ijma of the uh, Fuqaha of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. There's other theories as well. There's a theory that states that a Jewish man from Yemen named Abdullah ibn Saba, who's mentioned in Shia and Sunni sources, uh, he, um, during the time of uh, Sayyidina Ali, he wanted to create some sedition in the Muslim Ummah. So he started to call Ali God. He said, you are a divine incarnation. Um, and uh, many followers began, many of his people were persuaded and started to deify Sayyidina Ali. Uh, although that's certainly not mainstream Shi'ism or Ifta Sharia Shi'ism. So even amongst the Shi'a, there are many different groups. The seven are Shi'a called Ismailis, uh, and many of them believe in Hulul, which is divine incarnation. The Alawi Shi'a in Syria, um, this, this guy in Syria who's not going to leave because he likes his power or something, he's an Alawite Shi'a, Shi'i, and they believe in Tanasuf and Hulul. They believe in transmigration of the soul, reincarnation. And they also believe in divine incarnation, that Adi is a divine incarnation. Right? So the origins are a, a little bit sketchy. Um, but uh, So the ulama mentioned these different things, that uh, the political faction eventually grew into a relig religious distinction, or Abdullah ibn Sabah started this group that deified Adi, and then over time became the Shia, or the Jaysh al-Tawabin in Iraq eventually... Uh, evolved into the present day Shia Wallahu um, Adam but something like you know the country of Iran uh, was until 1501 a Sunni country Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, these are all from Iran uh, Imam Ghazali is from Iran Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani is from Iran right? Uh, 1501 the Safavid Empire uh, took control of the country by force and converted people to Ithna Sharia Shiism <clears throat> yes. Can you speak more about the historical significance of the Ummah not supporting uh, um, the sign of the time and or the historical significance of um, the Ummah being making uh, the Um. Well, yeah, the. the Zayn al Abidin surviving is extremely significant because, again, all of the Husseini Sadat, uh, they can trace their lineage to Imam Hussein, so that's extremely significant there. It was the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he would survive the massacre. Um, and I studied in Tirim, and uh, the Ba'alawi the Sadat in, in Tirim, they traced their lineage to Zayn al Abidin. So what happened is in Iraq in the 9th century, uh, Isa al-Muhajar, uh, he migrated from Iraq down into Yemen, Arabia Felix, because there was so much um, fitna in Iraq at the time. Uh, and there were a group of kind of pseudo Khawarij living in Yemen at the time called Ibadiya, and he converted them, and the lineage grew in, in Yemen. So if you go to places like Yemen, uh, in in, in Hadr al-Malik, you'll find a very large concentrated population of Ahlul Bayt. Imam al-Haddad is buried there, Sheikh Abu Bakr bin Salam, as we mentioned. Uh, so during this time of massive persecution of Ahlul Bayt, the hands of Bani Umayyah, many of the Ahlul Bayt, they fled from Medina and from Iraq and went to places like Yemen and also to India as well. A lot of Sadat in India. Um, uh, so... Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, mashallah, beautiful lady, and thank you so much for for all the beautiful things that you said. The the, the, the comment I have is is on uh, so one of the revival hadiths is um, that's mentioned is um, again the, the Prophet Muhammad's revelations um, 
taught Karbala and foretelling of Karbala. So when baby Fatma Zera got to know about it, she started to cry and said, well, so who is going to actually mourn Hussein uh, after he's gone? And then Prophet said, uh, Allah will create a community that will mourn for um, uh, Hussein. So that's another, um, you know, about like how Shia Islam was created uh, or established. But the, the, the comment I wanted to make was about the Sunni and Shia divide. And if you look at now, it's uh, for some reason Shias feel that they kind of own Imam Hussein, so they, are, they have the rightful ownage, if you will. Even though, if you look at everything we talked about tonight, the word Shia or Sunni never came up in this entire history. And it actually says in Surah Imran, uh, verse number 103 through 105, it's to you know, hold on tight to the rope of Allah and do not get divided among yourself uh, as sex. Uh, so there is a clear verse in the Quran, or verses in the Quran, uh, you know, uh, ordaining the Muslim woman not to get divided. So again, go, asking you where did it really come from? Where there are clear verses in the Quran and the Ummah still get divided? Yeah, yeah. My my personal policy is that I don't engage in intra-faith uh, debate. It's good to have dialogue, right? That's obviously, and uh, and you know, I got a call from a university. Um, brother to MSA, he said, you know, the Shia want to do a joint event with the Sunni, should we do it? I said, of course you should do it. Talk about things that unite, you know, that we have a, a foundational principle that's a love of Ahl al-Bayt. But for me, you know, this this is a, an issue that the greatest scholars of Islam that are giants were dwarfed compared to them. We're not even the shadow of them. They couldn't solve it. So the ulama say, do not engage in polemical discourse between Sunni and Shia issues. Imam Malik said it's haram for awam to engage in jidad and debate, polemical discourse, haram, right? But if you go to like some of these MSAs and whatnot, or if you go to like even the masjid, you have Muslims that don't even know, don't don't know the fara'i of wudu, or don't remember it immediately, and they're talking about debating Ash'ari, Maturidi, and Wahhabi, Salafi, and these types of things. You know, it's just a waste of time, and it creates enmity, and according to Imam Malik, it's haram. Even amongst the ulama, he says, Bakru. Even when sort of, sometimes Ulama have to debate and hammer out issues and things like that. So he says sometimes it's necessary, but even then it's Bukru to do that. Because even then there's a there's a chance of enmity between the Ulama. So this issue of Sunni Shia, we're never going to solve this issue. We're never going to solve this issue. We have to just accept it. It's a difference of opinion. The vast, vast majority of Ulama of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah say the Shia are our brethren. Imam Ali did not make takfir of Khawarij. People who are actively trying to kill him. So as long as their faith is, this is what they believe, these are the articles of faith, they believe in that. They have a weird way of going about in the methodology. But he was asked, what do you think about the Khwarij? He said, Ikhwanuna bahu alayna. They are our brothers who have rebelled against us. But when the Khawarij were asked about Imam Ali, one of them was asked, what do you think about Ali? He says, Ma How eloquent is this little Kafir? Referring to Imam Ali, A'udhu Billah. Right? That's a firqa. Wala tafarraku. You quoted the verse. Right? Wa atasimu bi habilillahi jami'an. Wala tafarraku means do not join a firqa. Don't join a sect. What is a sect in the difference of a sect and a madhab? We talked about this in the past. A madhab is a methodology that recognizes there's other methodologies within the hudud of what's permissible according to the sacred law. So Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanbali, uh, Naqshbandi, Qadri, Ba'alawi, these are Madahib, right? Within what's known as the hudud, the parameters of sacred law. And they recognize there's truth in all of these methodologies. We're not talking about, you know, Muslim and then Jew and then Christian. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about within Islam. We're not perennialists, right? We believe Islam is deen al-haq, no doubt about it. But if you join a firqa like the Khawarij, they say what? We have the truth. Everyone else is a kafir. It's haram to join a firqa. The vast majority of the ulama of the Shia, they say that the, the uh, Ahl Sunnah are our brothers. There's takfir going on by a minority group on both sides. I've studied with really conservative fuqa of the Hanafis who say these Shia are worse than Yahud and Nasara. They're more, they're bigger in their kufr than Yahud and Nasara. And I took fit from them. I don't have to believe in their aqidah. I'm a grown man. I can make my own decisions. 
right? And the va- again, the vast majority of the Shia, they say Ahlul Sunnah are our brothers, but Ali should have been the Khalifa. Khalas, right? So, um, and there's other issues that go into it. You know, the cursing of Sahaba is a, is a kufur, is a bid'ah. What is the the cursing of Aisha? It's really a sad situation. Is there a question from a sister, John? <coughs> Yeah, the word Ashura comes from Ashara, which means tenth or ten, right? So, Wahid is nine, Thalatha, Arba'a, Khamsa, Sitta, Sab'a, Thamaniya, Tis'a, Ashara means ten. So, Ashura is etymologically related to the word ten. In Hebrew, it's called Asara Bitishri, Asara and Ashara, and Ashura or exact cognates. So, this just means the tenth day of Muharram. And yes, it was coined before the birth of the Prophet. The Arabs, the pre-Islamic Arabs, the Jahali Arabs, it was almost a wajib in their culture. Obviously, there's no ahkam, but amongst the culture, it was almost a wajib to fast on Yomi Ashura. So they had great significance even before the Prophet ﷺ. And these are, uh, you know, unlettered Arabs who don't know about Jewish beliefs. They're not fasting on this day because of the exodus of Musa ﷺ. There's other things that they were told in Arab history that have significance with relation to Yom Ashura. Some of the ulama say that the uh, the Ark of Nuh salam docked on Yom Ashura and you know Ibrahim was going to sacrifice his son. Allahu alam. Many of these things don't have a strong senate, right? But there was great significance for the pre-Islamic Arabs for some reason or another about Yom Ashura. They would fast on that day even before the birth of the Prophet It's not wajib in the Sharia of the Muslims. Uh, it's in the Hanafi school. It's a sunnah mu'akkada to fast on the day of the Ashura and either a day before or after and just fasting on Ashura is makru to do that although it's still a valid fast but you should differentiate the Prophet ﷺ said from Yahud by fasting on the 9th also or on the 11th as, uh, in, in addition to the 10th day Sunnah al Yes. Yeah um, Yazid did send them back um, they stayed in in uh, in Damascus for some time, but then the women and Zain al Abidin were all sent back uh, with a big um, procession honoring them and so on and so forth. It seems like um, this was something that his advisors had told him to do because it really bothered, as you can imagine, the vast majority of the Ummah that this had happened to Imam Hussein at Karbala. So he sent them back into Medina, although, although Yazid did attack Medina shortly after. Karbala and kill many of the men in Medina that were at his bait. And as we said, he also, Ibn Zubair, remember we talked about Ibn Zubair, Abdullah Ibn Zubair, who had made Hijra, reverse Hijra with Imam Hussein from Medina to Mecca. He stayed in Mecca, right? Uh, and he was able to survive in Mecca. And uh, he led somewhat of a rebellion against the Bani Umayyah as well, but he was defeated in Mecca by Yazid, who brought a huge army into Mecca and eventually destroyed the Kaaba in the process. But yeah, the, um, many of the ulama say that the direct descendants of Hussein, even unto the 11th person, uh, was, was poisoned, was martyred, um, either by poisoning or, or death in battle. Definitely the Shia take that position. Um, and they say that the 12th Imam is the Mahdi. Right? This is a difference of opinion amongst the Sunni ulama and the Shia ulama. They say that the 12th Imam, so the, nine, the 11th Imam, his name was uh, Hassan al-Askari, and uh, his son is uh, Muhammad, who, according to the Shia, went into a minor occultation, a ghayba, when he was four years old, in the year 873. <clears throat> and what that means is that only certain people, his deputies, were allowed to speak to him, and he would speak to the deputies and, and communicate to the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. This is according to Shia history. Uh, in, in theology. Uh, and then at around 9.30 or so, he went into a greater occultation. Uh, al, uh, what did they call it? Um, the, 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 the Kubra, uh, al ghaybatul Kubra or something, uh, where um, the deputies were not even allowed to see him. Um, so the Shia say that towards the end of time, 
he will come out of his occultation uh, and lead the uh, the armies against the the Jal with Isa alayhi salam. The Sunni position is that the twelfth Imam will be born sometime in the future, or the Mahdi, I should say, will be born sometime in the future, uh, and that he will be a descendant of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Although the dominant opinion of Ahlul Sunnah is that he's actually a descendant of Imam Hassan, not Imam Hussein. And there's many traditions about the Mahdi, and many of them are weak. Uh, but what we can tell from our reliable sources is that he will come from, from Medina into Mecca as a fugitive. Uh, and that he will have uh, some of the physical features of the Prophet It's interesting to hear about this event that happened on the first of Muharram in 1400 Hijri in Mecca, there was a seizure of the Grand Mosque of Masjid al-Haram uh, by this man, uh, Juhayman al-Urtbi or Urtaybi or something like that. These students from Medina University came down into Mecca uh, and claimed that they had found the Mahdi. Uh, and it was Juhayman's brother-in-law, whose name was Muhammad ibn Abdullah, which is the name of the Mahdi. And he, he, he looked like the Prophet said that. He had a, he had a broad forehead, an aquiline nose, very beautiful face. He was around 40, 45 years old or so. So what happened was, right after Fajr prayer, uh, there were gunshots fired in the Haram. This happened in 1979, the first of, the first of Muharram in 1400 Hijri. Corresponds to 1979, November or something, 1979. Um, and gunshots were fired, and... Uh, and the uh, the microphone was pulled from the imam who was leading the masjid, uh, the, the Salat al Fajr, whose name was Sheikh Muhammad al Subayil. Uh, and then this man, Juhayman, he stands up and says, he starts talking about all of this end of times, you know, apocalyptic type of thing that's happening in the world. Uh, and he starts quoting a lot of hadith about the Mahdi and so on and so forth. And he says, Here is the Mahdi. So he pointed to his brother in law, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And he's also from Qahpan. He's, he's a descendant of the ancient Arabs, right? I mean, he's pure Arab, right? And he's a Sayyid from Imam Hassan. <laughs> uh, and they did all the research on this. And he's standing now between the Rukun and the door of the Kaaba. And he's accepting bay'ah from people, which is what the Hadith says. So the ulama in Saudi were really confused about this. This was a big fitna. Many of them said, this is Mehdi. He fits all of the description. The other said, how did he get to Mecca? He said, he got in a car and drove here from Medina University. He said, no, that's, that's how the, Me the Mehdi is going to come to Mecca. There's another hadith that says there's going to be an army that's going to oppose the Mehdi when he's in Mecca. This is a sound hadith. And the earth will swallow that army. So many of the ulama said, we're not going to send any forces against them because they're probably going to be swallowed by the earth. Uh, now, eventually... They decided that, because there's also a hadith that says that when the Mahdi manifests himself, you're going to hear of uh, a group of Muslims coming out of Khorasan that have uh, black flags, uh, and they're going to be going towards Jerusalem, and the Prophet says, if you have to roll yourself over ice to get there, to get to them, you should try to do it. But they didn't hear anything like that. And they check reports to see if there is a group of men coming out of Khorasan with these black flags. So they said, "No, this is this is a this is a this is a false a pseudo Mehdi." So eventually, they had to hire. I think it was the French paramilitary group to come and parachute into the Haram, and they had to do like a fake shahada and, and, the, and the helicopters. Oh, I should have went down. So they can come into the Haram. There was a war in the shadow of the Kaaba. People were being killed. This so-called Mahdi was killed in the process. Uh, Juhayman was taken prisoner by the Saudis uh, with many of the students that helped him. And they were all executed in public, beheaded in public and, um, shortly thereafter. Um, so that, that was a very interesting uh, historical event. You can, you can Google this, by the way. It's the seizure of the Grand Mosque in 1979. But to make a long story short, um, uh, both of us, Sunni and Shia, I believe in the Mahdi, right? And there's a hadith that says, Isa alayhi salam will descend at a mosque with a white pillar, and by ijma'ah, this is the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah say, this is the Umayyad Masjid in Damascus. Well, he will descend, and your imam is leading the prayer, and they say, this imam is Imam Mahdi. And Isa alayhi salam will descend uh, at Fajr time, right after the Iqamah, 
and he's wearing green, his hair is wet, as he's usually described in the hadith. He's leaning on two angels. So there's no mistake, this is Isa right? There's no there's nobody can say, well, maybe it's not him or so on and so forth. He's coming out of the sky, he's descending, and uh, the Mahdi will say that you can lead our prayer. And then Isa alayhi salam, out of respect for Ahl al-Bayt, he says, we will, I will pray behind you. The Iqama was called for you. Isa alayhi salam respects Ahl al-Bayt in this matter. Thank you very much. Please keep us in your du'a, inshallah ta'ala. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah.